We are honored now to have with us William Shockley, the inventor of the junction transistor. He was head of the team at Bell Laboratories, which developed the first transistor. And for this, the three men were awarded the Nobel Prize in 1956. Dr. Shockley, I understand you spent your childhood in Palo Alto. How is it your family came here and from whence did they come? Well, they uh, came from England. They were both Americans, however. My father was a mining engineer. And I maintain that I am probably a Cockney because I believe in the right weather conditions you could hear the sound of bow bells from the apartment where I was born. But I arrived in Palo Alto when I was three years old, went to school here, including the Palo Alto Military Academy, which is still going, and then did uh, my high school in Hollywood High School in Los Angeles. And then you went on to college? Yes, I went to um, Caltech for my undergraduate work and then to MIT for a PhD. I was a physics major uh, well, from about my sophomore year in college. And after your PhD, armed with your diploma, where did you go? I went to uh, Bell Telephone Laboratories at that time where I uh, worked for uh, C.J. Davison, who uh, won the Nobel Prize around 1938 for electron diffraction. And uh, he was one of the attractions that uh, brought me to Bell Laboratories. Little did he think he had another Nobel Prize winner coming to work for him, I'm sure. What were you looking for? Or what were you working on when you joined Bell Lab? What was your uh, period, uh, well, your subject of if research? Well, uh, if um, I were asked to uh, plan a better procedure than Bell Labs used to try to get me into the transistor business, it would be actually hard to do. They uh, took me away from Davison temporarily to begin with and had me work in the vacuum tube laboratory. And uh, I was given a uh, lecture by the then research director, Dr. Kelly, saying that he looked forward to the time when we would get all of the relays that make contacts in telephone exchange out of the telephone exchange and replace them with something electronic so they'd have less trouble. And uh, I uh, wanted to get back to solid state physics, which uh, was the field in which I had got my PhD, and I tried to see how to put these two things together how to do something electronic and make amplifiers, but to do it not with vacuum, uh, not with a vacuum of vacuum tubes, but to try to find out some way to do this uh, with solid materials. So you were looking for an amplifier? Yes, uh, my first uh, notebook entries, which are very important in a laboratory when you think you've invented something, you write it down in your notebook and get someone to witness it. My first uh, notebook entry on what might have been a working transistor was, as I recall, late 1939. Mm. And how many years was it before you really felt you had something to present? Well, the war intervened, and during that time I went out of physics and uh, worked on uh, problems of military operations, which, what is now called operations research. As a matter of fact, the uh, name was invented then. And uh, after that, I came back. There was reorganization in Bell Laboratories, and I picked the objective of trying to uh, see if we could make something which would do the same sort of job as a vacuum tube, but to do it with uh, crystal detectors. They were the same sort of materials that had been used in the war to uh, do the detection that goes along with the klystrons that we heard about earlier today. This seems like a reverting back to um, almost aboriginal electronics. Um, we're taking the crystal detector. Uh, tell me how you happen to uh, go from there to your transistor. Could this have been an accidental discovery? Well, it could have been an accidental discovery, I believe. It didn't come that way. As a matter of fact, all of the theory that we needed to, uh, to do transistors had been well developed before we really got one to work. And, it, uh, and even after the point contact first worked, it was still some time before we saw the uh, really simpler um, matter of the junction transistor. But it, it could have been an accident, uh, I believe, because um, during the war, and in fact back to the 1910s, it was found that if you made a cat's whisker detector, which consists of putting a uh, point contact on a crystal that I let this book represent the crystal, uh, this has uh, rectifying electrical properties. Now if someone had simply studied the interaction of two points electrically on one another as they were brought close together, it's quite possible that a transistor might have been invented back in 1915. Could we have and skipped the whole vacuum tube technology then? Well, uh, 
I would be very reluctant to take a position on that because <laughs> of the extremely competitive attitude between the vacuum and the solid state electronics. I think they have been uh, supplementary and there are many things that uh, can be done with vacuum tubes that the transistor can't, uh, can't do today. And this may remain. Of course, there's competition. People are hoping that somehow, by uh, solid state means, one will be able to make a, uh, a flat television tube, for example, which now requires a long shot of an electron beam. Looking forward to the, um, the new inventions that are yet to come, uh, I'd like to have you tell me uh, your thoughts on the nurturing of creativity in the young people today, in our homes and in our schools. I know you've done some deep thinking on this. I'd like to know your thoughts on it. Well, I think a good deal of it is probably built in uh, genetically when the individual starts out. But it can certainly be discouraged. I think one of the uh, things that is least effective in encouraging creativity is to give the impression that the, that the student so often gets in school that uh, all of the nice things, the important things, are found out nicely and neatly. It has been my experience that everything, uh, all of the more difficult inventions uh, I've made, and I counted recently and I find I have some 85 issued patents, which makes me at least close to being in the major league on numbers. Um, most of these require uh, many failures to accomplish. One must, uh, it's my own experience that to uh, do creative work, one must overextend oneself, one must count on falling on his face, on getting into difficulties. One must learn from these failures and not be stopped by them. But, one, uh, but if one is taught that everything is neat and orderly and one never gets into a mess when trying to do anything new, then he will be so conservative that I don't think he'll break new ground. I think the big contribution that can be made, uh, maybe the biggest educational contribution that could be made to the creativity of people is to uh, persuade them that they shouldn't worry about making mistakes. This will be inevitable if they are going to really do anything new. Thank you very much, Dr. Shockley.